Tibet was among the last Asian lands to come into contact with Buddhism. Buddhism arrived from India in the 7th century CE when a Tibetan king invited two Buddhist masters to Tibet. As with the Northern Wei and Tang dynasties in China, the king was hoping that Buddhism would help unify his kingdom by creating a common religion among the people. But if Buddhism came late to Tibet, nowhere did it become more central to national cultural identity. Tibetan Buddhism also developed some unique features, most of which, unfortunately, I really don't have time to discuss. But I do want to mention Tibetan Buddhism's great emphasis on the importance of the Lama, or spiritual leader. Over the centuries, Lamas played increasingly important roles in Tibet, not only as religious figures, but also as political leaders. At various points in Tibet's hunter history, a Lama was actually in charge of the government. Here we see the Potala Palace, which was constructed in the 17th century by the Great Fifth Dalai Lama. It was built to represent the sacred Mount Potalaka, home of the Bodhisattva of Compassion. Each Dalai Lama is said to be an incarnation of this Bodhisattva. Potala, which is both a monastery and a fortress, was the seat of the Dalai Lamas until the communists took over China in 1959. The Jokong Temple is the holiest in Tibetan Buddhism and the site for the installation of each new Dalai Lama. In front of the temple, there's a large plaza and open porch where Tibetan pilgrims prostrate themselves. The most devout pilgrims cover the last several miles, prostrating themselves continuously on the ground. Many pilgrims bring offerings to the chapels that, that ring the shrine or leave scarves outside in the open porch. So let's watch a short excerpt from a Buddhist-made documentary about the palace and the temple. Jokang's interior is a dark and atmospheric labyrinth of chapels dedicated to various gods and bodhisattvas. The cloister leads to the central hall, which contains Jokang Temple's star attraction, the Jowo Rinpoche. This life-size statue of the Buddha at age 12 is the holiest object in Tibet. Tibetan Buddhists believe that this image was crafted during the Buddha's life by a celestial artist with the guidance of the god Indra. Tibetans seek to pray to the statue before they die, since they believe that its energy will transform them and help them at the time of death. Often, when Tibetans become sick or die, their relatives offer gold to the statue. The gold is directly applied to the face and body as an offering to the Buddha. A sick or dead person's name is written in gold on red paper and is then burned in front of the statue in a lamp. The current 14th Dalai Lama has lived in exile since 1959, but is still acknowledged by Tibetans both within and outside the country as their nation's spiritual leader. And now we close our whirlwind tour of Buddhist art in Japan. Shinto was the earliest religion of Japan, and it persists in some forms to the present day. Most Shinto deities are local. Many are associated with agricultural seasons, planting, growing, harvesting. They also tend to be associated with specific clans and ancestors. This focus on nature would carry into Japanese Buddhism, especially Zen Buddhism. Buddhism arrived from China and Korea around 700 CE, at a time when the court of the Japanese emperor was increasingly adopting Chinese customs and culture. Japanese emperors also hoped to use Buddhism as a unifying force, notice the theme here, at a time when the empire was threatened by civil war. In 720, the emperor moved his capital to Nara. During the Nara period, Buddhism would become a national religion, and the Japanese aristocracy would increasingly adopt the cultural values of China. This is perhaps the most famous of Japan's Buddhist temples. It is built in the traditional pagoda structure of the travel to Japan from Buddhist China. This image hall or kondo is one of the largest wooden buildings in the world, and it's been rebuilt several times after fire and earthquake partly destroyed it. The original building was even larger and more magnificent. The Temple House is the world's largest bronze statue of the Buddha, standing almost 50 feet tall. This is another Vairocana Buddha, the celestial cosmic Buddha who lives in Nirvana. Building this gargantuan Vairocana Buddha required thousands of craftsmen. It also used up all the copper in Japan, <clears throat> which almost bankrupted the state as it was, it was designed to protect. The copper was gilded when gold was discovered in Japan about the time the statue was completed. 
the all-pervasive power of the Vairocana Buddha gained extra significance when the emperor proclaimed that his ancestor, the great Shinto sun deity Amaterasu, had revealed to him that she and the Buddha were one. And here again, we see Buddhas emerging with older traditions and accommodating uh, local customs, a little syncretism again. So which mudra do you see? The hand is raised in the fear not mudra, especially appropriate for protecting a nation. Over the following centuries, the power of the emperor and the imperial court gradually declined and passed to the military clans and their armies of samurai warriors. One of these warriors seized power in 1185. He moved the capital from Nara to Kamakura, just south of Tokyo. He took the title Shogun, which literally means general. This gateway was built in 1199 as part of the shogunate's reconstruction of the monastery after the Civil War and following a revival of Buddhism at Nara that was too also promoted by the shogun. Note the imposing size and strong, severe lines appropriate for military leadership. These guardian figures stood at the gate and were created at the same time. The Nyo, as they are known in Japan, are traditionally named Agyo, the open mouth statue representing the beginning of the universe, and closed mouth Ungyo, representing its end. Once again, we see the warrior spirit of this new regime. Look at those fiercely glowering eyes, tensed muscles, and swirling draperies. Do not mess with the Shogun, and do not mess with his guardians. These huge sculptures were designed and created under the supervision of the leading sculptor of the Shogunate, Unkei. His workshop was known as the Kei School. The statues were built around a core of ten massive Japanese cypress timbers bound together. The statues of more than 3,000 parts held together with large posts or iron clamps and nails. The outer skin was covered with a mixture of linen and lacquer, then painted. The samurai rulers who took over in Japan were also Buddhists, but they followed a different school of Buddhism called Zen in Japanese, Chan in Chinese. Samurai were drawn to Zen Buddhism's focus on finding inner peace and enlightenment through meditation and self-denial. Samurai followed a code called, code called Bushido, which taught followers to embrace the possibility of death at any moment. Zen Buddhism also taught samurai practitioners to clear their minds of all thoughts before battle, which helped them overcome fear and distraction. So where did the Zen Buddhist warrior or monk go to clear his mind? To the most famous form of Zen Buddhist art, the garden. So let's take one last quick video tour, this one courtesy of Khan Academy. The Rianji Dry Garden is about the size of a tennis court and is composed solely of 15 large and small rocks, some encircled by moss, grouped in five clusters on a bed of carefully raked white sand. From a distance, the rocks resemble islands, the sand a tranquil sea. As the video and your reading pointed out, it's impossible for us unenlightened folks to see more than 14 of the rocks at any given time. Zen monks led austere lives in their quest for the attainment of enlightenment. In addition to daily meditation, they engaged in manual labor to provide for themselves and to maintain the temple properties. Many Zen temples constructed dry landscape courtyard gardens, not for strolling, but for contemplative viewing. Cleaning and maintaining these gardens, pulling weeds, tweaking unruly shoots, raking the gravel, was a kind of active meditation. Another popular Zen garden style was the promenade garden. These were designed to capture, but also to improve upon nature. This isn't actually a required image, but it makes this point well. Japanese Zen gardens often used borrowed scenery, the Japanese term is shake, to strengthen the feng shui or spiritual forces contained within the land. We'll see the, um, this emphasis in Chinese and Japanese landscape painting in a later unit. Because Kyoto is bordered on the west, north, and east by low but very visible mountains, borrowed scenery was easily incorporated into the garden design. So this plan of the garden is the third required image. I've added a labeled version from the internet to make it clearer. Note that the complex includes several other temples and gardens. And we've run out of time. We will now move to the third great religious tradition that we will consider in this unit, the faith and art of Islam.